This is why I find it always very inspiring the work I've been doing with people in prison. I've been based in America for like since 94 or something. And when I was editing our Buddhist magazine, I was in California and I got a letter from this young Mexican fellow who told me he was 18. His name is Arturo. Um, he told me he'd been in prison since he, he's been in gangs in Los Angeles. He's in really intense gang activity since he was 11. He'd been in prison, basically juvenile prison since he's 12, in and out until he was 16, then tried as, a, as an adult, and then got three life sentences. I mean, the prisons are pretty intense in America, I tell you, and the, and the sentencing is pretty intense. And the numbers, they say that, you know, it's an accepted number that the United States has 5% of the world population, but it's got 25% of the prison population, meaning a quarter of all humans on this planet who live in a prison live in the US. The sentencing is so severe, I can't tell you. I'm not trying to say they're all saints. I'm not trying to say they're all psychos either. I mean, there are many psychos out of prison. We know that well. But somehow, you know, it's a really intense system. It's been like this for so long. So I got this letter from this young, this young guy. He'd read a Buddhist book. And he told me he was in this top security kind of prison where they're kept in their cells 23 hours a day. And then one hour walking up and down another cell, basically. We're allowed to have 10 books, but no hardback because you could whack your cellmate. The inside of a pen, because if you have the hard part, you could stab your cellmate. They live in these six tiny cells, I don't know, two meters by something? Th tiny, eight foot by 10 foot, whatever that is. And always got, I missed the meters, I don't know why it happened. When I left Australia, I was still feet, you know? Not like I lived in England, they have feet, and in, England, in America, they have feet. Anyway, um, so he, basically, they live in these cells 23 hours a day, and they have one hour out, and they have these 10 books, the inside of a pen, one pad, and that's it. You know, that's their life, sometimes all their life. It's kind of intense. So he was in that environment. He'd read this Buddhist book. And so it, th this project started from there. Within a year, you know, we had 40 people writing. It was word of mouth, you know. And so we developed that project where people would write, we'd send books and take, take their phone calls, etc., etc. And because as a Buddhist, you know, it's considered really rude to try and convert people. That's extremely bad-mannered. You only respond if a person wants, wants something from you. So, you know, it, it kind of spread. And I found it so moving because there they are, these people in this outrageous situation, you know, where you, you can't pick your nose in peace, I tell you. There's no freedom. And this is, this is the point I'm going to get to, that when, you know, Buddha's got this saying, if you can change something, hey, please change it. No big deal. But what if you can't? That's the point. Then what, you know? So somehow the, the Buddhist approach, the ones who wrote to us and then over the years, and we were sometimes getting a thousand letters a month, this is in America but also in Australia, um, you know, and, and they, so many of them who like this approach, and they're all working class, the young Mexican gangsters, all the black guys, all the ones who would never hear Buddhism on, the daily, on, their street, on the streets, and people are totally poor. I mean, it's everywhere, isn't it, I suppose? It's always the poor people get into prison, the rich ones can afford the lawyers, you know? Anyway, what I found so moving over the years working with these people was because they couldn't, they didn't have the freedom to change anything. I mean, I really mean no freedom to change anything. So they had no choice. You go mad or you change your mind. And these words are so simple, change your mind. I mean, we could spend the rest of the evening just clarifying that point, you know. But this is the point. So I found it so empowering. These young guys, these young people, mostly they were men who wrote to us. I don't know why, many women in prison who really wanted to use these tools to make their situation that they couldn't change, and many are on death row, many have life sentences, you know. One of the rules in California is if you get arrested and sentenced for the third time, even for stealing a video, it's a mandatory life sentence. Thousands and thousands of them in prison on this mandatory life sentence. Anyway, so I, I, felt I was full of admiration for these human beings who didn't have a choice, you know. So then you can't change the outside world when you change this one. So this, we, we hear these words, but somehow we have this luxury, isn't it? We could leave the job anytime we like. We could leave the husband anytime we like, but actually we don't think we can. Oh, but no, it's not, not the right thing. Oh, I wouldn't get another job. Oh, no, I shouldn't leave the husband. Oh, I might upset people. We have all these fears and worries that we might as well be in prison because we feel as if we are paralyzed by our situations. And this is what's, I think, the, the, the tragedy for many of us, you know? We're not living on the streets. We're not totally poor. We've got a, probably a house back there and a bed to sleep on and, you know, maybe some money in the bank or a credit card at least. I mean, most poor people have probably less credit, less, they have, anyway, whatever. 
but somehow we, you know, we, it's almost like we feel that we don't have choices. And that's the real suffering. That's the, the suffering of feeling paralysed by our environment, paralysed by that job. We go to the job, we can't stand it, we go home, we're miserable, and we really, it just doesn't seem to occur to us. These words are so simple, it's embarrassing. And this is really the heart of Buddha's advice. There's more to it than this, but this is the heart of it. And it's kind of profound, if it weren't so simple, that we really don't realise that we actually have the choice to change the attitude towards the job, that we, have the, we can have the choice to change our interpretation of home. But this, of course, is the hardest job we'll ever do because we've, we've been brought up with the view that happiness is out there. Then you, then you get the husband, get the kids, get the house, get this, whatever, the job, and then it turns into becoming disappointing. And then there's this paralysis, you know. And then we kind of, it's just, and this is the, the biggest suffering. This is the worst suffering in a sense. Not having this feeling, not having this sense of confidence that my mind is mine and I can change it. And all that means is to reinterpret the husband. To re if you don't choose to leave, then change your mind about him. I mean, it sounds so simple, but it's infuriating because it's, it's enormously difficult. And in a sense, one of the other obstacles to doing this is you'd think, well, you know, let's say my hubby's cheating or he looks like he's cheating or he looks at the girl or something or he's lazy, or he doesn't put the toilet seat down, or I hear that men don't put toilet seats down. I don't have a man in my life, so I don't know. <laughs> but whatever the thing is, you know, whatever the thing is, somehow because we're so addicted to believing that the outside world should be just so, so that I can be happy, and this is how we all are, it's very, it's, this is our tendency, then the millisecond something goes wrong out there, you know, it's like, what do you mean I should change? It's not my fault. I'm allowed to be angry or I'm allowed to be jealous because he is doing that or the boss says this. So this is a, there's, a, there's a truth to that. Buddha agrees. The boss might be lousy. Buddha agrees. Your husband's looking at somebody else. He's accepting and it's not appropriate. Totally agree. But he says, if you can change it, please change it. But what are you going to do if you can't? And that's the point. And just to get to that simple point, I tell you, is the hardest thing we will ever do because it, it, it feels like, what do you mean I should change? It's not my fault. Why should I change? We feel, you know. So this really, one thing about the Buddha, the Buddha's view of the mind that's so practical is this, the, the, and this is part of the whole business of karma. And we'll go into, I mightn't go into that tonight. We'll see. But basically the Buddha's idea of the mind, and it's sort of obvious, is that whatever goes on in here, every millisecond, isn't it? We have thoughts, feelings, emotions. All he's really pointing out is that what goes on in here not what goes on out there is the main source of whether we're happy or suffering. And again, these words are not complicated. And I think in a sense we know it. We do this every day. We change our mind about something every day. You know, your sister wants to go to that crummy movie. You don't want to, but out of kindness to your sister, you decide, okay, you go and you enjoy it. That's called changing your mind. I mean, we know it. It's not secret. It's just that it's really hard because we're so addicted to thinking, if I get it this way and I get that movie, I get this food, I get that husband, I get this thing, that thing, and we spend all our lives manipulating the outside world to get it just so, and then we're convinced, now I'll get happy, you know? And we know it doesn't work like that. Kind of, we know it. So it's not a complicated idea, and it's not a religious idea, and it's not a moralistic idea. You should change your mind. You shouldn't be angry. Not like that. It's practical. It's practical, you know? And again, the, the, my friends in prison, I find that so powerful. I've got this friend on death row in Kentucky. I've known him for like 20 years since I first started this work, more than 20 years now. He's getting ready for his death date. He was a regular guy. He wasn't one of the psychos. You know, he had guns. They all have guns in that country. He was dealing in drugs. His friend is also there too. And he's in, both in prison together. And he, you know, there was a shooting and people died. He's not a psycho. So, of course, he's completely come to terms with his own life, his own reality. He's regretted his, the harm he's caused. And he's, got, he's, he's, you know, done all his appeals. Uh, 30 years later, appeals have failed. They're going to kill him, you know. And he said, Rabina, I'm ready for that electric jolt. So I can see some knowing him all these years and taking on board these, these practices. He's really, you know, this white country boy from Kentucky, you know. He's just, just, he just he works every day on his mind. He's become content. He's become fulfilled. He's really kind to all the other 40 guys on death row. That's his home, basically, you know. And there's a bunch of psychos there, I tell you. 
So he's just content in his life because he's changed his way of interpreting his world. In other words, simple words, he's become less attached, less angry, less depressed, less jealous, less anxious. I mean, it, the words are simple, but it's the hardest job we'll ever do, but most worthwhile. Whether you're a multimillionaire, whether you've got ten husbands, whether you're poor, this is the, the heart of the job, you know. This is the Buddhist approach. But like I say, he's not a creator. He doesn't own this stuff. This is, human, this is just human nature. And we sort of do it anyway. But, but Buddhism runs with this approach. And it goes in more depth about this, of course. But this is the essential job day to day. This other woman I remember reading about in prison in America. I always quote her. I, never, I didn't meet her. She's, um, she, was, she was this hippie with a hub, hippie hubby, hippie kids, hitching in Florida. This is 30 years ago. More, maybe. And they got picked up by two blokes. And then the coppers stopped the two blokes and the, cop, and the two blokes killed the coppers and blamed the hippies. So they're on death row in Florida. They're like you, you're the lowest of the low animals if you kill police, right? So they're innocent, completely these hippies, you know? Innocent. You can't even conceive of this suffering. The husband was executed even, you know? Completely innocent, lost the kids. And at some point, after, she got out after 17 years, and at some point she said... I, I realised I couldn't change anything, but they couldn't take my mind from me. So I decided, I'm not a prisoner, I'm a monk. I'm not in a cell, I'm in a cave. So it sounds kind of noble, we love to hear these things, but if you think it through for like f two minutes, it's absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, look how we get when someone accuses us of breaking that cup that we didn't break. Or someone at work thinks we lied and we didn't. We nearly have mental breakdowns. We become so distressed when the smallest opinion about us isn't perfect. I mean, I'm not being mean about us. We're all, you know, join the human race here. When we can't change that person's opinion about us, it, sometimes we can never let go of it. We can never get past it. We can never get past it. It's unbearably painful. We all know this. We can't imagine that environment, that situation. I don't think she was a Buddhist. I think she did yoga and things like this. But it seems to me that's unbelievable intelligence. It's like having this courage, and I would put it like that, intelligence, to see the fact that she couldn't change the things. People weren't going to change their minds. So the point was interesting. She just didn't give up. She never stopped working for her freedom, and she got it eventually. And that's the point that I find so fascinating. She didn't become kind of, we tend to think you fight tooth and nail and shout and scream and yell until you get justice, or you give up and become passive. No. She decided that she couldn't change these people, so she didn't go mad bashing her head against a brick wall, but she didn't give up trying to get out of prison. And she succeeded finally. So I, I just find that beyond incredible. Such a powerful story, such an extreme example of all I'm trying to say here, you know. And the simple reason for this, it's nothing holy. It's for your own sake. 